Beasley, receptionist for the Kyokie Baptist Church office. Thank you for spending this time with us as we worship and declare the greatness of God. Our mission and vision is described in three Ds, declare, demonstrate, and disciple. If you'd like to find out more, just take a look around our website, kyokie.org. You'll find helpful information and some great resources as well. If there's a way that we can pray for you, just click on the contact tab or call our office at 706-541-1086. We want you to know that you matter and your story matters. There are some special events coming up and you're invited. Ladies, the annual Women's Ministry Kickoff Dinner is next Sunday, August the 8th at 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Come and enjoy a delicious meal, some great conversation, lots of laughter, and hear all about the exciting plans for the year ahead. And if you'd like to decorate or host a table, just contact Elizabeth Smith via our, the link of our website. The following Sunday, August the 15th, we'll gather in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. for a night of worship, music, and prayer time. Gospel in the routine. As summer break ends and schedules pick up, we want to use the time to focus on Christ and commit ourselves, our families, and our plans. The evening will wrap up with a dessert fellowship. We're also excited about Wednesday night fellowship meal and discipling classes start back on August the 11th. Dinner is served from 5 to 6.15 with classes for all age groups, children and students and adults from 6.30 to 7.30. And for all those interested in joining our Sanctuary Choir, rehearsal is at 7.30, right after classes. If you'd like to support the ministry for Kyoki Baptist Church financially, you can give securely online or by using mailing address. Thanks again for setting aside this time. In a few minutes, we'll open up our Bibles as Pastor Steve continues the series Transform. But first, let's sing together Praising Christ Our Savior. Say it. 
Welcome, and thank you for joining us as uh, we approach the Lord of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ. Uh, this is uh, Kaioki Baptist Church, our online worship service of Jesus, and, uh, and it's really good to have you, have you be a part of this. Things are really starting to crank back up. We have had a time, a little bit of rest throughout the summer, but as school begins to come back, um, so too do, does the activity part of what we do, um, especially regarding our Sunday schools, our Bible studies, which we are changing what we call and reference our, our Bible study groups. Uh, we are going to begin to call them discipling groups because really, at, at its heart, that's what that's what. Sunday school is about. That's what, what we call K group. Our small groups are about. It is about disciples making disciples. And so, as you as you go to our website kaioki.org and you see that verbiage, discipling groups, uh, the distinction will be between. I will have discipling groups that that gather on Sunday mornings. We'll have discipling groups that gather on Wednesdays. We'll have discipling groups that gather throughout the course of the week. Um, some are larger. Some are more sm more uh, smaller number. But the the intent is through the um, through the living, active Word of God. People's lives are being changed. Those who are followers of Christ uh, at Kaioki, our definition of a disciple is someone that is that is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the cause, the mission of Jesus. And uh, in, just in case you're watching this and you're wondering what's happening at Kaioki on this Sunday, um, our children and our teenagers are. Uh, this will be our promotion Sunday, so. Uh, many of our our young people will be elevated if if you 're in third grade if you are, have left third grade and you 're a rising fourth grader, you will be moved to the appropriate fourth grade class and so i 'm um, especially excited about those that will be rising into the, our, to the first grade uh, discipling group because each first grader will be given uh, the Bible. Because what we teach and what we do revolves around Scripture, God's Word. And uh, so if you, by chance, happen to be watching this before Sunday at 945, go ahead, throw some clothes on. Well, <laughs> if you're in your jams, go ahead and throw some, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you dress yourself, and get to, if at all possible, uh, Kaioki Baptist Church in Appling, and uh, if you've got a first grader, join us in our fellowship hall as we're going to have breakfast together for the for the um, young people and and their parents, and then we will award our first graders each a Bible. Well, I pretty much convoluted, messed that up, didn't I? I tell you what, before we open God's Word today. Why don't we pray in, in our live worship services? We always pray at the beginning of the school year for teachers, administrators, and especially students. So join me as we ask God to bless the teaching and preaching of his word out of Ephesians, but also what's about to take place, not just throughout Appling and, and our community here in uh, CSRA, but really right throughout the country. So let's pray. Father, thank you, for, thank you for you. Thank you for the way you never give up on your people. And, um, and Lord, you can just continually show yourself to be true, to be good, to be holy, to be merciful. And Lord, I want to thank you for those that have joined us through our, this online worship service. God, I pray that you would bless them. If they've got families, bless that family. If they're single, uh, maybe they're recently single, God, just pour out your grace upon them. And Lord, together we lift up those that will maybe 
for the first time be embarking on school as a student or as a teacher, as an administrator, or maybe this is just another year in a career of doing so. But we pray for all of those people who will be investing their lives into teaching, into seeing that young people uh, learn. And God, may you bless that they, what they will be learning will be true and uh, will be build and will build them up. Uh, God, we are thankful for those that have um, have really dedicated their lives to making sure that this is done and done well. And Lord, it might be a public school system, it might be a private school, it might be homeschool. But Lord, you bless. And as your people, we would, we would ask that you would bring all things, whatever category a particular school or school system that may fall in, we know that in you there is a greater purpose. And that is to bring all things under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ so that in those things they will declare your greatness. So we love you. And God, we thank you for this opportunity now as we turn our attention to your word. In Christ's name we ask, amen. All right. Um, we have been looking at what it means to be transformed, at what it means to be changed. A few, just a short time ago, I gave you our definition of what a disciple is. And, and one of those, one of the aspects of being a disciple is in following Jesus, I am being changed by Jesus. Um, we base our definition off of um, a statement, a calling that Jesus gave to a couple of brothers, Peter and Andrew, and then James and John, out of Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus said this, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Um, the follow me, a disciple follows Jesus. Fish, I will make you fishers of men, the, the mission, the cause of Jesus. And then that middle part being changed, I will make you, Jesus said. I will make you. Our vision statement as a church here at Kaioki is that we are declaring the greatness of God as he transforms lives by loving and reaching people and making disciples of Jesus. And that second phrase in that opening line of our vision statement, as he transforms lives, that is, is what being changed by Jesus is about. Your life is transformed. The Bible calls that process sanctification. It is, um, it is um, caught in what we call the three Ds, declare, demonstrate, and disciple. And uh, at the heart of it is that happens when somebody's life is changed, is, uh, is sanctified, it's transformed. So we have been looking at the, la the last few weeks at exactly what God uses to change his people. Because it's not just one thing. He uses obviously life, but we've been zeroing in on a handful of aspects of life that God we learn through his word intentionally uses to change us to transform us so that I look and in my case I look less like Steve and more like Jesus the value system that Steve once had before I knew Christ is is morphed into the value system of Jesus. And that just doesn't happen because I go, you know what, I'm tired of that value system. It happens because Christ through his spirit is alive in me. So we've, we've seen that God uses his word, scripture, to change us. And that he uses prayer to change us. Prayer is when we come into his presence and... Um, and we bring before him our worries, our anxieties, our concerns, our desires, as well as our joys, our, our praise. And at the same time, we take time to be silent and just be in his presence. 
That's prayer. That's prayer. And he uses that. He uses the truth that is his word. He uses his presence, prayer. And then last time we looked at the fact, and it was, it's an uncomfortable fact, but that God uses suffering to change us. There, with God, there, there is purpose in everything. And there is especially purpose in our suffering. And it, there, there are manifold reasons and manifold ways that God uses suffering. So if you're struggling and you haven't, if you haven't looked at last week's message, I would just encourage you, maybe when this is over or sometime this coming week, just to, just to check and see how God uses suffering. But today we're going to look at the fact that God uses the church to change us. And it is, again, with intention and with purpose that God uses the church. And it's just as he, just as it is impossible to be conformed to the image of Christ without the word or without prayer or without suffering, it is impossible to be faithfully conformed to the image of Christ without his people, the church. And I can all... <laughs> I can, I can already project and see that for some of you there is a rolling of the eyes and maybe a move toward the clicker to shut us down, to shut me down, or toward your iPad or whatever you're watching on and just say, I sure don't need to hear about the church. Now for some of you, this, you know, you're going, man, I wish I could be I wish I could be with the body of Christ. I wish I could be with the family of God. Even today, if you're watching on a Sunday, because you miss it, maybe you're sick, maybe you're ill, maybe due to the uncertainty of COVID, uh, you've got some morbidities that you're, you know, you're concerned, some health issues that you're, are keeping you from fully engaging with church, but you're waiting for that day you can. Man, bless you. And, uh, and, and you stay the course because we too want you back because you need to be back. God made you for, if you are a Christian, he made you to be a part of something greater than yourself, and that is his church. However, for the ro those that are, are, tend to be eye rollers and, uh, and a little bit distant from the church and you don't need another lecture on the church, I just want to challenge you. Stay the course today. I, I, I'll assure you we won't go more than about seven hours on this message. Just a joke. Um, just, just filter what you hear through Scripture, even the Scripture that we're going to focus on. And if what you hear me saying is, um, is not so and not true, then um, shame on me. But I want to assure you that God's Word is true. God's word is true, and he is faithful. I, I think of Jesus and his disciples on the road to Caesarea Philippi. It's found in Matthew chapter 16. It's, it's when Jesus asked his disciples, who, do people, who are people saying that I am? And, you know, they give him various people, various answers, John the Baptist, Elijah, and then he kind of calls a time out. And he looks them in the eye and he says, but who do you say that I am? And, uh, and Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in that encounter with his disciples and in that, that session, that, those moments, had to be very sweet, very intimate, Jesus makes a fascinating statement to his disciples. He says this, this is Jesus. I will build my church. I will build it. I will build it. There, uh, just If we had only that in all of the Bible recorded about the church was that statement of Jesus saying, I will build my church. It should give us pause. It should cause us to say, Lord, what in the world is this church? The, the idea of the church, the word in the New Testament that is used for church is not a new word to the disciples. It is the Greek word ekklesia. 
It, is, uh, it means assembly or gathering. It was, it's really comes out of the Old Testament, the Hebrew. It's from, it's from a Hebrew word that means assembly. And if you will recall, in the, um, in the Old Testament, from the time of Sinai, when Moses gives the commandments and comes down with the law, often the people are called to assemble and the people gather in an assembly. Well, the Greek word for that Hebrew is ekklesia. So it really is not, it's not we sometimes think, oh, the, the church is new at Pentecost. Well, the church receives the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit at Pentecost. But the truth and the reality and the idea that God has a people, he will have a people that will represent him, that will be his, is an Old Testament truth that is born out and we see and we recognize in fullness in Christ. And when you read the opening chapters of the book of Revelation, we kind of see how it's manifest in heaven itself, right? Where the nations gather, the tribes of the world that those that have surrendered to Christ gather around the throne of God and they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's a beautiful picture of the assembly, of the gathering, of the church, the people of God. Uh, just, we are going to dive into Ephesians 4, but, uh, but this, this is really important because I think it signifies to us the relevance of the church. Sometimes people say, man, that church, it's just irrelevant. Um, I've recently heard a comedian kind of bash the church. Is, is the church really around? Haven't they, haven't they gotten the memo, we really don't need you anymore? There is this sense in our modern, cool culture that we just don't need the church. But I'll take you back to John's Gospel. Um, over the last month or so, we have really referred to and even looked at, as we've talked about what it means to be transformed, John's, um, John's telling of that final night of Christ, and specifically from chapters 13 through 16, Jesus teaching the disciples that he is leaving, but that he is sending the Holy Spirit to them. And well, that section ends with a very intimate, beautiful prayer of Jesus that he offers to his Father. It is the longest, it is the fullest, it is the most personal prayer that we have recorded of Jesus to God the Father. And in that prayer in John chapter 17, at the beginning of the prayer, he asked the Father uh, to glorify him, Christ, so that he will in turn glorify the Father. So as Jesus prays that the Father will be glorified through him, through what he's about to do, it's, it's as if he is consumed throughout the prayer with the glory of God. But as, he's, as, as he prays that the, the, the Father will be glorified, that he will be declared great in all ways and in all things, he prays for his church. He, he, he says to the Father that he has not lost any of those that he has given to him. And he prays not for the world, but he prays for his own. He prays for the ones that the Father has given to him. That's the church. That's the people of God. And so it's no small thing that Jesus in Matthew states, I will build my church. And in John 17, in those, his final hours before he's arrested and then the next day crucified, that he prays in the midst of this picture of the glory of God that God will pour out himself on his people, on his people, separate from the world, right? There's not this... There's not this picture of 
everybody is the child of God and that Jesus is praying for every soul and every person. No. Now, every person is made in, in the image of God. They are in, in the womb. They, they, bear, they bear this likeness of God because they have a soul. But there is, a, to use another passage in the Gospels, there is a winnowing out. And there is a distinction between those that have received the good news of Jesus Christ and surrendered their life and accepted him as as their savior their lord their 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 maker and those that refuse to do that many are called few are chosen we are to get the good news the gospel out to all people all nations of the earth but not all will believe some will reject And so there's a distinction even in this prayer that Jesus makes to his Father that um, he will be with his own. He will be with his people, his church. So um, the church is used in a couple of different ways. In the New Testament, there is the sense in which the church is the church universal. It's all of God's people, all Christians, all those that have received Christ been cha- and are being changed by Christ or have gone on to be with Christ. They've, the Lord has called them home. They've died in Christ, and they are with him. Um, and then there is the church local. And it is the second way that it is primarily used in the New Testament. Norm, the normal reference to the the assembly of God's people is a local assembly most of the New Testament epistles are written to either a specific local church or a group of local churches Um, and in the New Testament the church is described in various ways um, various pictures that the biblical writers refer to the church. Uh, The church is called his family, uh, his people, the Lord's vineyard, uh, his building, his flock. Um, One of the most beautiful ones, they're all true, but I, I love the image, and it's found in actually the Ephesians, which we're going to be looking at today, is the bride of Christ. The church is his bride, and it, and it, uh, it, 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 it affects me greatly when I hear people put down the church and diminish the church because you need to know that if that's you, what you are ultimately doing is you are spitting at Jesus' bride. You are smashing the bride of Christ. You are um, laying waste to his bride, his bride. But the most common way that the church is referred to in the New Testament is the way we're going to see it it used in Ephesians chapter 4, and that is the body of Christ. It's used um, in Romans as the body of Christ. It's used in Colossians, the body of Christ. It's used several times, both in Colossians as well as in Ephesians. So let's finally get to actually... Uh, the passage that we're going to look at. And, and we're going to look at, at beyond just verse 6 of Ephesians 4, but I want us to read at this point the first six verses of Ephesians 4. So here we go. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. Now, this is the Apostle Paul writing, so the I is, is Paul. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you... That's the you is the church in Ephesus, the body of believers in Ephesus. Urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, um, what do you think of when you think of a body? And how does it relate to the body of Christ, the church? Imagine, if you would, going in for um, a physical, a medical exam uh, to the doctor's office. And so you walk in, you check in, uh, you have to update your paperwork, and, and you're sitting in the lobby, and you know, you're doing all right at this point in time. And you're there for a while, and then all of a sudden, the nurse walks out and calls your name, and she or he takes you back to a smaller examination room. And there you sit for anywhere from five minutes, or sometimes it seems like five hours, not, not slamming doctors and doctor's offices, just being real. And, uh, and you're waiting, and the anxiety starts to ramp up, and your nerves are going crazy. And then finally the doctor comes in, and he gives you the physical, the exam, what that might look like. Well, another kind of physical, another kind of exam is what's called a post-mortem. And that is when you're dead. Your body breathes no more. It's, you're, you're, you're not there when this exam is given. Well, a lot of people want to examine the body of Christ and unfortunately, um, for many people, that examination that they make is more of a postmortem than a living physical exam. Uh, they, I referenced this earlier, they see the church as no longer relevant uh, or as totally unnecessary. No big deal here. And some even view the church as dead. But here's what, I, here's what I want us all to understand as we go through this passage in Ephesians 4 is that what we just read in these six first verses, while there is reference to the church as the body, I think it's fair to say that whatever this body is that's being described here, it is most certainly alive it's alive and that our life the life of this body the life of the local church the reason it's alive is because Jesus is alive and he's the one that gives his body life and because he's alive so too is his body making the connection because our head, the head of the church, Jesus, is alive, so too are we. And my guess is that some of you believe that the church is a goner. It is a relic of a, of a distant age. But I want to tell you, there is um, that attitude and that understanding is more of a, ref of a reflection of your relationship with Christ than any true observation on his bride. I would just challenge you and encourage you to read the actual word of God and, um, and maybe try to do so with some humility and a willingness to be taught and learn and not to be so close-minded to reality and to truth. Because here's, the, here, here's, here's what I know, and enough of the chastisement. I, I realize that um, most of us that have been in churches or have been in many churches have seen congregations that seem D-E-A-D. -E um, perhaps they've traded the call to follow Christ and they've come up with a better idea. Maybe their numbers have winnowed and they're, 
they've said, you know what, this Jesus stuff is not working, or this Bible stuff isn't, isn't it's not catching. People aren't buying in. So let's let's try to be, let's try to be more entertaining, or let's lighten up let's let's give less jesus and more fun or less scripture and more personal opinion or less holy spirit and more personal feelings or less truth and let's provide more safety from the offense of the truth because some people are just getting angry and upset they don't like what the bible says or how it's being taught and that's, that's, that's reality. Some churches do that, but it's, uh, it's, it's something that a church that desires to be a living, active, faithful body of the Lord Jesus must push against and must constantly go back to what he actually prescribes and de- describes in his words. So I want to give you in the time we have left, <laughs> four realities about the body of Christ. All right, now, These realities are just really observations uh, taken from Scripture. They're truths, okay? So let's go back to that physical doctor uh, that was doing the examination. If, if the doctor begins his examination and he looks at the body and the head is missing, right, um, then he's immediately going to stop and he's going to write autopsy and he sends the body down to the morgue. But that's not the body of Christ. I want you to look down with me at verse 15 and we're going to cover this section um, in just a bit. But in verse 15, Paul says, Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So not only are we to grow, trans, be transformed, be changed, um, which is the whole basis of this message, but we, there, there's, an, uh, there, there's an object, there's an objective that w- the change is moving toward, and that is Jesus. And so as the church, we are to grow up in every way into him who is our head, who is the into Christ, into Christ. So when, when you need to know when, when you read uh, the, the references, especially in the New Testament to the church um, as the body, there is, this, there is this recognition that the head of this body is Jesus. And I, I'm just going to read to you Ephesians 1, verse 22. Um, it's talking about just the supremacy of Christ, just, just how amazing he is. And Paul writes this, and he put all things, that's God the Father, put all things under his feet, that's Christ, put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. Now, not just all things of the church, but, but God the Father has given all things that are, all things that are, to the church. All right? What a beautiful picture. He is, he is um, our head. Uh, so how does that reality of chapter 1, verse 22 play out in the church? How, how, what does that look like for those that are a part of the body of Christ, a part of the local church. Well, back in chapter 4, in verse 7, Paul writes, but grace was given to each one of us. Now, um, according to, now just stop. Grace was given to each one of us according to. Well, first of all, who's giving the grace and according to what? Grace was given to us in the church according to, well, just pick up the rest of of the verse, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So, question, by what right, what right does, does Jesus 
have on those that are a part of his body. All right? What, what does that look like? How does that play out? And, and, and remember, we're just referencing back to verse 22 of chapter 1, how he who is, has all things have been placed in his hand, he brings to the church. Um, what, what does that look like? Well, just keep reading. This could be a little, little iffy, but it's not meant to be iffy. It's not meant to be difficult. Paul continues, therefore it says when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now he's quoting a psalm here. And then in verse 9, he gives explanation to that psalm. He says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? Now, Total freebie, an aside. Some people think this is a reference to Jesus going under the earth and that in those days in the tomb after his crucifixion, he went into hell, the places of the dead, the places of the dead, and preached. That's really not what Paul is saying here. What he is saying is that he who had ascended, he descended into the lower regions, and in the ESV there's a comma, the earth, meaning he came below the heavens to earth. It's referring to his incarnation. Verse 10, back to our lesson. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens. Now here we go. That he might fill all things. All things. Who might fill? That Christ might fill all all things. Your life within the body is always, always, always in relationship to Christ. What he has given, what he has allotted, the function of the body, the control of the body, the church, is always in relationship to Jesus. Therefore, we are also because it is he who gives and it is he who fills all things, our life, our purpose is in submission to Jesus, our head. Okay? Remember, we're looking at the fact that Christ is the head of his church. All right? So it begs a question. If Christ is in all and he is filled all things and he has brought all things to the church and because the church is his it's his body it is absolutely alive so what 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 it begs is this why do people push away from the church why do people neglect the church why did they say, you know what, I don't need this. I don't need... Now, they don't, they don't put it this way, but in backing off from the church, they are backing off from the body of Christ. We are his. They're backing away from the bride of Christ. Well, when you're looking at a, when you're looking at a body and you've got an arm that is disconnected, from the rest of the body that is disconnected let's just say from the head then that arm is going to die right and there might be a let's let's say it's not severed it's just it's not working in connection to what the brain what the head is telling it to do uh, there might be a lot of reasons for that they might be neurological it might be muscular uh, but spiritually speaking when a person backs away and is disconnected from the body of Christ, there's this break between the head and one who is a part of the body. There's only one reason, and it's spelled S-I-N. It's sin. It's sin. To, to neglect the body is to neglect the head. To back out of life with the bride of Christ is to rebuke Christ himself. So, 
I don't know, maybe you're this person, or if you meet somebody who is really out of sorts with the church, they are disconnected from the body of Christ, you need to know that the underlying reason, and there might be lots of excuses they offered, um, sermon might be too long, the music's too loud, who said there were drums in the worship, what, 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 the carpet's old, whatever it might be, right? Those people are mean to me. They don't talk to me. A lot of excuses. The underlying reason is their personal sin, their rebellion against the head of the church. And um, I just know if I'm disconnected from the body, then ultimately I am disconnected from the Lord himself because he is the head of his church. Okay, so the first reality is just that our head is Jesus. Here's the second reality, and that's this. Our oneness is in Jesus. Not only is Jesus our head, but Jesus is, the, is, is what gives us cohesion. Our oneness is in Christ. While we confess Christ and we receive Christ singularly, individually, we live out our faith together. That's what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. So just looking back at those, the first couple of verses in, in chapter 4, Paul says, I, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Um, well, how, how, how does that, how can we walk worthily? Well, he goes on to say that um, in verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, there's one body and one Spirit. There's, there's a pattern here. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Because we are walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called, there is a unity. We are one. There's one Father, one Lord, one Spirit. The reason we struggle to live together in peace and in unity is not because everybody else refuses to do things your way. That's not the source of the struggle. But it is because we refuse to practice what he says in verse 2, that we are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love. So if I was going to personalize this, I would say, all right, Steve, the reason that I'm struggling to, to function in the body of Christ that is Kaioki, I'm not, but let's just say I'm personalizing it, is not because of the rest of the church refusing to see things my way. Now, that's, that's maybe what I think, but the reality is it's because I have refused to practice humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with the rest of the body, okay? In other words, our first, our first blush response when we get out of sorts is to tend to point the finger at everybody else in the church. But what Paul is saying here is, man, you need to look in the mirror. You, you, really, you need to recognize that to live as a part of the body of Christ, the local church, it takes a lot of humility. And it takes much gentleness. And it, it, it takes patience. And you have to bear with one another. And that forbearance is something that is, is brought about by a love for those people. That's the only way it's going to happen. It's the only way it's going to happen. Um, Truth is, uh, we struggle sometimes. We struggle sometimes with 
decisions that are made and actions that are taken and we get our feelings hurt by the church that we're a part of and um Listen, I know some, you, there are times in a, in, a, in a Christian's life when there is a need to move and, and, and leave a local body. Maybe the gospel is no longer being preached. Maybe there is a, a lack of accountability. Maybe, um, maybe Christ is being dishonored. All kind of reasons. Um, but... My encouragement is to find a local body of believers that does preach the good news of Jesus Christ. They are faithful to the inerrant word of God. They seek to declare the Lord in all of his greatness and all of his glory and then to demonstrate his love by sharing the gospel with those that don't know him and do that in the context of making disciples of Jesus. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great? You know, this is just a selfish thought. If everything was just as I, or just as you, always wanted it to be in the church. You know, this is kind of a dark, dark picture. You know, the music was inspiring, and it lifted your soul to heaven, yet it was soft enough to not wake you up from your nap during the service. Or the message was deep and full of profound truths and great stories and powerful testimonies, but it only lasted 12 minutes. Or your husband, who attends, attends church a grand total of three times a year, if he would only, if the, if the church would only make him chairman of deacons, you know, or lead. Bible study teacher wouldn't that be wouldn't that be wonderful um, or wouldn't it be tremendous if nobody ever got upset or offended and you always got your way or how glorious would it be if new people were flooding in but they never take your parking space and they never sit in your pew well the reality check is that's that's not that's not happening, is it? It's just not going to, because that's not of God. God has his reasons for calling us together, to worship together, to do life together with each other. So we come together and we worship. And we grow together with one another. And we do life together with each other and we make disciples with each other and we declare his greatness with each other and we do all of this now hear me as our transform as our transformation is taking place but before it's complete before it's complete now we'll do those things after it's complete but this is what scripture tells us it looks like as we live in this life unto the Lord. So, the church, the body of Christ, we gather, we pray, we worship the one who knows all things, the one who knows what is best for you, for your family, and for the church family. And when that happens, we see amazing things occur. So our head is Jesus. Our oneness is in Jesus. And here's the third reality. Our uniqueness is through Jesus. Here's, here's the fact. We are, we are united together through Christ but we are also unique through Christ in the fact that he gives gifts. Again, back to verse 7, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Uh, put another way, only it's the same reality, Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, he says, all these gifts are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So um, we have been given gifts. 
And I think sometimes we struggle with being a part of the body of Christ because we don't recognize our place in the body of Christ and that it's okay to be different. Now, that doesn't mean we differ around the centrality of the gospel, of the truth of God's word, of the faith, but it means, hey, let's recognize God has gifted us. He has equipped us to do different things and to have different likes and dislikes all under the umbrella of the one we declare is God, right? And, uh, and he's transforming all of us into the image of Christ. And, and we, the goal of our different unique giftedness is to demonstrate his love, okay? But we make disciples, and we make disciples in different ways, and different people are, are gifted in different ways to do that disciple-making. So what keeps somebody from being an active part? Why do people push against the idea of serving and using the gifts that God has given to them? If you're in Christ, you've been given gifts. Well, one reason might be just cluelessness, right? Uh, there's an ignorance to what God's, God's gifts are about. I just I want to make a very gentle suggestion. If 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 I'm maybe drilling a little close to home, and you're not active in a local body, and you're kind of wanting to turn a deaf ear to talk about the fact that if you're a Christian, he's in he's given you gifts to serve and to be a part, an active part of the body. If you don't know what your gifts are, and that's why you don't use them, my suggestion is to go to someone that you trust who walks with Jesus well, who will kindly, graciously walk you through serving. Because the best way to discover what your gifts are, if you don't know, is by serving. And sometimes that means by trial and error. I, I, I do this, I go and I, you know, kind of administrate in the, in the local body. And if I hate that, it's probably a good indication I don't have the gift of administration. Or let me, let me host people in, in my home and invite people into my home and feed them and make them feel comfortable. And man, I really groove to that. Well, maybe that's where God has gifted me. Or, or maybe I even really suck it up and 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 swallow hard and and teach one of our disciple grouping uh classes and i love it i love the prep work i love the communication part i didn't think i would i was i was scared to death doing it but man that was good that was sweet okay maybe god has gifted you to be a teacher within the body but try it. Because listen, if you either don't want to know your giftedness or you know your giftedness, but you're too busy to use those gifts in serving, what's happened is you've been disconnected from the head. And that's on you. Because Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. Okay, so sometimes there's a cluelessness. A, a, a second reason is... is when you privatize, when you privatize your faith, when you privatize your serving, you, you isolate yourself apart from the church, apart from the body. You know, the nice thing about being aloof from the church is that you are somewhat of a free agent. There's no accountability. There's no structure. Uh, you can do your own thing. The, the bad part is you're living in disobedience to the Lord, all right? And then an, another reason, and it'll, we'll just, I'll give you this, and we'll, we'll move on to the fourth reality, but sometimes there's this sense of deficiency where I see myself as being inconsequential to the body. And uh, hear me, if God gave you the gifts, there is no way that those gifts that he's given you are inferior or inconsequential, okay? You're not deficient in anything because you're not relying on your own skills and your own capabilities. You are simply faithfully using the gifts that the Lord has given you, 
Okay, final reality. Thank you for your patience, um, but this, this one really counts. The fourth reality is that our transformation results in Christ-likeness. Our transformation results in Christ-likeness. And that happens within the context of the church. Okay? Uh, now, I, I realize God can save people on their deathbed and take them home, and they've never, you know, so they've never been a part of a church. There's the thief on the cross, right? And uh, who asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom, and Jesus said, This day you'll be with me in paradise. Okay, those are the exceptions. But the general structure of Scripture is that you experience transformation from the time you receive Christ to the time he calls you home. And, 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 and if, if you're counting on a deathbed conversion, you are exhibiting great hubris <laughs> and tremendous arrogance. Look down at verse 11. Notice, and he, that's the Lord, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. What did he give them to? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Um, now, there's some debate as to whether or not the, the, the office of apostle and prophet uh, is still was just a first century office that went away when the disciples, the original disciples and Paul died off. Uh, I tend to think that at least the office of apostle, because in the New Testament an apostle was someone that was an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. Uh, those are no longer, we no longer have those. They spoke for Christ. Um, the prophet, um, I think, I, I'm not so sure it's manifested today as it was in the first century because now we have the word of God. The evangelist, uh, I do believe, is an active function, a gift to the church active today. Um, this word, it, it, it probably is more in lines with what we think of as a missionary, someone that goes to people that have not heard of Christ and teaches and preaches to them the gospel. And then the shepherds and teachers, th those go together. That's not two separate offices. That some of your translations say pastor and teacher. Uh, that word shepherd is the word for pastor. That is one office. A shepherd or a pastor is one that teaches. And the purpose of the pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And the reason this matters is found in verse 13 until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. That's why this matters, right? I mean, to grow the body in Christ-like change together. Imagine a baseball player who tries to play all nine positions. He pitches and then he goes to retrieve the ball wherever the ball is. If it's behind home plate or if it was hit into the outfield, he goes to retrieve it. He tries to run down the, the base runner. Um, he's all over the place. It's not much of a game, is it? And by the way, the that one player is exhausted and soon finds out, I can't do this. But add eight other players who are playing in the positions that they're best suited for, i.e. they're gifted for, and wow, it's totally different. And Paul is saying here, listen, the pastor, the, the shepherd, the teacher, is not given to the church to do everything. 
He is given to the church to teach the Word of God and to equip the saints to do the ministry. The pastor has the responsibility to help the body so that the body can help not just one another, but those in the community by demonstrating the love of Christ. That's why we are emphasizing in our small groups, our Sunday schools, classes, our K groups, disciple making. There is this objective beyond being friends. When we gather together, it's not just about fellowship. We are disciples. That means there's transformation that is to take place. And that only happens when the Word of God is properly taught and the word is humbly received and lived out, and the process is multiplied. And it goes and it goes and it goes. Now, I want to just close out by making a personal confession. Um, and I make this as a pastor. And I may, not, I may not be the pastor of the church that you attend, or maybe the reason you're not attending Kaioki is because I failed you. And that's, that's possible. That's more, more than possible, okay? I, I, um, I certainly experience failure in my own life, and sometimes that failure affects the body. But I know that for many of you, there is a desire, whoever your pastor is, that, that he be everything you want him to be and that he be everywhere you want him to be. And hear me, I certainly don't want to be that guy who is locked away and harder to get a hold of than Willy Wonka, all right? Truth of the matter is, to, to my Kaioki family, I, I usually really get a charge of being with our church, with our people, just individually i love talking with our people praying with our people visiting our people and i know that for some it seems like i can never do that enough because i wasn't there for this event or i didn't show up for for that however this is what i know i know that the best hope for kaioki and the best hope for you is not that you experience more of me, or if you go to another church, the, the, your best hope is not that you experience more of your pastor. Your best hope is that you experience more of Jesus Christ. And you, if you are an active part of the body of Christ, the local body, wherever you go, wherever you're a part of, God has called you to go out and to affect and to minister and to serve so that the people aren't pointing a finger at your pastor saying, well, why isn't my pastor here? And they're not pointing a finger at you and saying, well, thank you for showing up. But that in your ministry and in your serving, they see that Christ is doing this through you. And that he is their hope. And I, let me assure you, he is your hope. He is your, no one else. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. And he uses himself and his people to change you. So that when he calls you home, the worship the adoration, the recognition of his majesty, the declaration of his greatness is not a new thing to you. That you have been conformed, you have been transformed into the image of Christ himself. And biblically, the way he does that is through his word, through prayer, through the pain of suffering, and through his church. Don't disconnect yourself from the body of Christ. Let's pray. God, bless the hearers of this message. Lord, for those that have, for whatever reason, been hurt, have moved away from the local body, I pray, God, 
that they would, trusting you, trusting your word, they would re-engage and move back in. And for those that have somehow heard a a false gospel that says, I can follow Jesus separated and removed, distinct from the body, the church, Lord, that's false. May they turn from their sin, and that's what it is. And Lord, may they become a part of that local flock. God, we love you. And we thank you that you have loved us with a love that never fails. And so we pray and we change and we grow into the image of Christ, to the glory of Christ. And we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, thank you for your patience. I know we've gone over time today. Uh, I think it was worth it. I hope it was uh, in the eyes of the Lord. And we're going to wrap this, this time up by worshiping him through song one more time. So God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next time.
Oh 